Good morning. Welcome. Happy Friday. Really cool to have you all here. Uh, today at 1 o'clock, when we, 1 when we come to lab, uh, we won't do problem set 6 or quiz 6. We'll take the second midterm exam. That'll be the only thing we do. Um, there's two things that are due, the exam prep and uh, the determination KSP Delta G Delta H Delta S for calcium hydroxide lab. Uh, the lab afterwards, uh, like I've been telling you, is kind of a fun lab. And on Wednesday, they thought it was fun. Now, maybe they were just being nice to me. I'll be honest, I don't know. But I think they liked it. Um, it's kind of cool. It's a lot different than the other labs. There's no measurements, no sig figs, no calculations, no math, um, a lot of chemistry changes and stuff. Uh, John and I were talking this morning how solubility is affected by pH a lot. And you will change solubility based on pH and stuff in this. So anyway, for what it's worth, I think it's pretty cool. Um, try not to wear open-toed shoes. Uh, try to bring your safety glasses. I have some if you need to borrow them. Uh, should be pretty cool. This week's uh, lab is more uh, colors of white and black, but next week we're gonna see lots of colors. So uh, this similar kind of a format. So anyway, I get excited by it, obviously. Any questions on anything? Um, chapter 18 and chapter 19 are the last two chapters of Chem 223. Uh, we will not be going over chapter 18 at all. Uh, chapter 18 is hopefully just a big review, all right? It's over the main group metals and non-metals. And on the periodic table, anything with an A group uh, is a main group metal or non-metal. Um, and I think the stuff in chapter 18 is more just kind of a review. So if you have the energy and stuff and you want to go through it, awesome. It'll be a great reminder of the things we've studied since Chem 221. But I do want to talk a little bit about chapter 19. Chapter 19 is going to go more into coordination compounds. And coordination compounds is really nothing more than the complex ions we've seen. There's going to be some kind of transition metal center with Lewis bases around the outside. And if the complex ion actually doesn't have a charge, then it's no longer a complex ion. It's a coordination compound. All right. But anyway, this whole section, Lewis acids, Lewis bases, the center will almost always be a transition metal. It's kind of cool. There's one more naming system I want to introduce you to because once in a while you see these names and they're just huge. And at first it's like, ah, <laughs> even I feel this way when I see these names. But if you break it down, uh, they're actually pretty chill to figure out. So one of the big things I want to talk about in this section is colors, all right? And color is something that made me choose inorganic metal chemistry over anything else because I really like the colors, all right? It's silly and dorky, but this is where I get. So the color of objects usually comes from the paint of things. So for example, my tripod here is mostly black with a kind of a red trim. The black especially is going to be some kind of a paint that they apply to it. You might ask, well, where does the paint get its color? And that's a great question. Paint is made from pigments, all right? Different types of things go together. They make the different colors you see. If you've ever been to like Miller Paint, they can make almost any color because they take these different pigments and mix them together. It's a fascinating kind of a thing. But what are pigments exactly? Good question. Nothing more than transition metals, all right? All these pigments and stuff that are used are just different transition metals. As the transition metal uh, has different charges on it, i.e. loses electrons or sometimes gains, you'll see different colors. So on this little chart right here, which I found, these are just kind of uh, an example of some of the colors you can see. And a lot of the things will uh, trade uh, different kind of pieces and different charges, but they're really, really neat. Transition metals are really awesome when it comes down to that. So transition metals are the B group in the middle of the periodic table, all right? And we've talked about a lot of these so far. Uh, lanthanides and actinides, the two long groups at the bottom, often are considered transition metals too, with some slight similarities. But anyway, transition metals are all over the place. They're in uh, rubies, sapphires, a lot of the, if you go to the jewelry store, a lot of the things that are colored will have some kind of a metal center. 
Also, a lot of the biomolecules that we use a lot have transition metals, and hemoglobin, number one, uh, hemoglobin is an iron-based system in our body that transports oxygen and all kinds of stuff around. In industry, transition metals are also really critical, all right? Um, one of the biggest transition metal uses, I, I would argue, is titanium-4 oxide, sometimes called titanium dioxide. It's nothing more than a white pigment that's used. So things that are white often will have TiO2. And I've been amazed how many things have TiO2. Um, in addition to paints, like you'll find it in like toothpastes and uh, hand lotion creams and all kinds of things which are really fantastic. Um, Prussian blue was a famous compound, uh, I believe, at the end of the, 19, of the uh, 19th century. They couldn't have uh, blue used in fabrics very well until Prussian blue was created. And you can see that Prussian blue was just a weird combination of many different irons. We're going to talk about how to interpret compounds like this in this chapter. Uh, but anyway, transition metals, super cool. <laughs> now, transition metals are the light blue right here, definitely. Now, my periodic table is old. The transition metals now go all the way over here. There's also some main group metals, non-metals under there. I do want to point out the F blocks down there. They're sometimes referred to as transition metals. Um, the top group is called the lanthanides, and the bottom group is called the actinides. Um, these up here are primarily the groups that use the D electrons. And in Chem 221, when we talked about electron configurations, this was a 3D1, 3D2, etc., like that. And we'll go through that a little bit here. These down here are separated because that's when you start filling in the F block, the F electrons. So the 4F1s, 4F2s, 5F1s, and stuff like that. Um, and again, we'll review this here as we go through this, because I know it's been a moment since we've talked about these things. <clears throat> but the main transition metals are these uh, group right here. <clears throat> it's uh, the 3D, the 4D, and the 5D. And a lot of these are ones that you've certainly heard of before. So gold and mercury, all right? Molybdenum and chromium, cobalt, all right? Stuff like that. Um, all of these transition metals have partially filled D subshells. And because they're partially filled, like you can add and subtract, mostly subtract electrons, to create variable charges. So in Chem 221, if you were with me, we used Roman numerals when talking about almost all of these, like zinc, cadmium, and silver, they're fixed charge, but everything else, there's more than one possible charge. So we'd have to know if it was iron plus two or iron plus three. Or we've seen with the battery stuff recently, uh, we've seen some examples of manganese two and manganese seven. So all of these kind of numbers, the Roman numbers, will help you to figure out what the charge is on the metal. <clears throat> So when it comes to these transition metals, they're very flexible. They are metallic, all right? Yeah. They're malleable, which means they can bend if you have a pure version of it. Um, they're not as reactive as the alkali and the alkaline earth metals. Uh, since Chem 221, I babbled about adding sodium potassium to water and it makes exciting explosions. These aren't gonna be that much fun, all right? But their color is more than make up, in my opinion, for anything else. Uh, transition metals, pretty high melting points and boiling points. The densities are usually really dense. Osmium and iridium are the most dense elements known. Now, we're going to talk about this again. We talked about this briefly in Chem 221. The S shell right before the D block is partially filled or empty, and those electrons get pulled out first. And that's one of the things that makes the transition metals really different. Um, because you have these electrons coming out and you have variable numbers of D electrons, most of these have a lot of different charges. So while sodium has only one oxidation state, positive one, all right? And that's all you ever see unless you're in a lab or next to a black hole or the sun. On the other hand, iron, positive two, positive three, positive six is common. All of these things are possible with the transition metals, all right? You can argue that like zinc and silver maybe have fixed ones, but most of them pretty, pretty flexible, pretty variable. 
paramagnetic and diamagnetic were terms we used in Chem 221 that we'll talk about a little bit too. Um, diamagnetic, every orbital can have two electrons. And to the two electrons, one is spin up and spin down. And in Chem 221, I talked about how spin up is like if you spin with a magnetic field and spin down would be against the magnetic field. And if an orbital has equal up and down electrons, that's when it's diamagnetic. Diamagnetic things are usually not attracted to magnetic fields. And most of the things in our day-to-day -day world are diamagnetic. But the paramagnetic ones are also really important. They're much more reactive. They will have just a spin up without a spin down, for example. And they can cause chaos in terms of things like aging. They can also cause degradation of samples and stuff. Um, if I had unlimited time, I would talk about something called crystal field theory, which is a way to describe the energy transitions for compounds you see. And crystal field theory is kind of like valence bond theory in Chem 222. Um, we use valence bond theory to, and to sp2, sp3, sp3d, that kind of stuff, to talk about the bonding. And crystal field theory is something analogous for transition metals that helps you understand where the colors come from. Uh, I will not have time to do that this term, but if you're curious, you can see the notes and stuff like that uh, in the rest of this chapter. So anyway, electron configurations. This is the noble gas argon. And in electron configurations, scientists get really bored saying 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6 all the time. So argon is that electron configuration. 1s2 gets you to helium. 2s2 gets you to beryllium. 2p6, you can see there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 2p6 gets you to neon. 3s2 to magnesium. 3p6 gets you to argon. So argon in square brackets means you have all of those electrons. But then scandium, the first of the transition metals, will have 4s2, so filled up to calcium, plus one more. So scandium is an argon, 4s2, 3d1. But wait, I just said 4s2, 3d1, and here it's 3d1, 4s2. In transition metals, this is really common because the first electrons out are the higher n. Four is higher than three. And so the 4s electrons will be the first one out. And like I've talked about a lot, there's a lot of different ions of transition metals. So removing the electrons is something we're going to do a lot of. And the first ones to be removed are the 4. So you can write scandium, for example, as argon 4s2 3d1, or you can write argon 3d1 4s2. This one is getting you ready to make ions. 4s2 3d1 is what you read off the periodic table. Questions on that? Okay. S orbitals hold up to two electrons. So like potassium and calcium, that's two. The four refers to the number that goes in front of the S. So four S2 would fill up to calcium. Three S2 would fill up to magnesium. The P block on the right hand side has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. The number is this number right here. So 2p6 gets you to neon, 3p6 gets you to argon. The three Ds, all right, you, when you get to the D block, you have to use this number minus one. So that's one weird thing about the D block. So this is the four minus one, three D block. Yttrium starts the four D block. This would be the five D, et cetera, et cetera. But when you count it up from scantium to zinc, there's 10 elements there. So that's 10 electrons. So d orbitals will hold up to 10 electrons. So you can see then here scantium, titanium, vanadium, we're going 3d1, 3d2, 3d3, just kind of filling it in. Now, if you remember from Chem 221, and if you don't, I understand. 
Not everything follows the N plus L rule perfectly. Fascist Mother Nature. No, seriously. While we'd expect chromium to be a 3D4 for us too, for different reasons, some are known, some are unknown, one of the electrons jumps ship from 4S. Chromium is an argon, in this case, 3D5, 4S1. If you ever wrote it on an exam, 4S2, 3D4, I would absolutely give you credit, but officially this one breaks the rules that scientists use. Fascist chromium. Anyway, you keep going then past the other ones, then we go back to the pattern. So manganese, we see 3D3, this would be 3D5, the next one, iron 3D6. Uh, I'm skipping uh, cobalt, but nickel would be a 3D8. Copper is another one that breaks the pattern a little bit. Instead of being a 3D9 for us two, for whatever reason, 3D10 for us one. And then zinc continues the trend there. So that's a very fast reminder about electron configurations. Any questions? Okay. Oh, I missed cobalt for a reason. No, seriously. Which uh, of those different electron configurations would represent cobalt? All right. Now, cobalt is number 27 on the periodic table. So that means the total number of electrons is going to be 27. Now, argon is 18, all right? If you look on the periodic table, argon over there is 18, and we need to get to 27. So one way to do problems like this, at least to figure out what is possible, 18 plus 5 plus 2, 18 plus 7 uh, would be 25. So that's not quite right. We need 27 electrons. If you go to this one, 18 plus 9 is 27, all right? That seems like a pretty good fit. So notice there that I was literally just counting electrons to get to cobalt. Now, you have to be careful in case there was like a 4S1, 3D8, or something like that. But generally, that's a pretty nice way. Just count those superscripts and stuff to figure out what's happening. Any questions? Now, once you figure out the neutral atom, then you can start going crazy on the uh, different charges. And here's a list of some common charges for these transition metals. And notice that basically all of them, except scandium, don't have a positive two. And we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. But then most of them have plus three, plus four, manganese is plus seven. I would argue that iron has a plus eight that's pretty common, but anyway, you know, I don't, no one listens to me, no. Anyway, zinc we never uh, put a, a Roman numeral next to because really it's just plus two, all right? Um, sometimes even I will use zinc Roman numeral two, but 99.9% .9 of the time zinc is just plus two. It loves being plus two. But the other ones, because there's more than one entry in the column, that's why we use Roman numerals. Um, there is a scandium plus one, uh, but uh, anyway, scandium is one that would be the next most likely to not have a Roman numeral. Now, the higher N electrons come out first, so for example, we saw that uh, titanium was argon 3D2, 4S2, and the four of 4S2 is a higher N than the three. So this would be like 4S and 3D. If N is four, the number on the far left, then four minus one would be 3D. And what's really important for this chapter is that those four S electrons, the S electrons, will come out before the Ds. And that's why almost all of these have a positive two, because they like to get rid of those electrons and stuff, usually, so. So, here's another question about cobalt. And it says, how many D electrons does the cobalt three plus ion have? So, let's go back to the periodic table. If you start with scantium, you can count the number of D electrons in neutral cobalt. So one, two for titanium, three, four for chromium, five, six, seven. So cobalt by default has seven D electrons in the neutral version. But we're not dealing with neutral cobalt right now. We have cobalt plus three. So it's tempting to say seven minus three will have four D electrons. But remember that when it comes to these transition metals, the S ones right there 
always the first ones out. All right, highest n comes out before highest n plus l is what I said in Chem 221. So if there are seven cobalt electrons and we're losing three electrons total, the first two will be these two and we'll, use, we'll lose one of the seven electrons. So there's gonna be six d electrons left. So of the three electrons that were removed to make cobalt plus three, the first two were the 4s, all right? Neutral cobalt was argon 4s2, 3d7. And making cobalt plus three, we pulled those 4s out right away. And after that, we pulled one of the d electrons out. All right, so here's just some fun. Um, iron is very common, of course, with things like steel and jazz like that. Uh, neutral iron is argon 3D6, 4S2. And I'm writing it this way because right away, when you make positive two iron, those first two electrons are those 4S. So this is why people will write it this way sometimes. And honestly, I don't care if you write it 4S2, 3D6, or 3D6, 4S2, but this is why they do it. It shows the electrons that are first out. Iron plus two has no 4S electrons. If you make further ones like iron plus three, then you can start taking out those D electrons. And that's what we did with that cobalt example. It had 4S2, uh, 3D7, I think. The 4S were out first one of the three D's was gone later. Okay. Now, <clears throat> paramagnetism and diamagnetism, super important in this stuff. And again, this is a review, but I think it's important to go on to it. If you have orbitals, this is orbital box notation from Chem 221. You place each electron in its own orbital first, and then you start pairing up when they're done. Now. Chromium is weird. It doesn't follow N plus L rule. It was 3D5, 4S1. And what this is one of the reasons why they think maybe chromium does this is each electron is in its own orbital. Each one of those up arrows without a down arrow makes it paramagnetic. This is one of the most paramagnetic species possible. You've got lots and lots of electrons by themselves in the orbital. On the other hand, palladium here, <clears throat> palladium is another exception to the rule. And when you figure out its electron configuration, each up arrow has a down arrow. This is the example of when something is diamagnetic. So palladium is one of the most diamagnetic systems out there. Chromium is usually really attracted to magnets. Palladium could care less, all right? So again, ups and downs means diamagnetic. And even if there's only one unpaired electron, the whole thing is paramagnetic. But with palladium, all the 5s electrons jump ship, and palladium is very, very diamagnetic. Okay. So that's kind of Chem 221 electron configurations revisited. Uh, any questions on any of this? Okay. Now, in this section we've just been through in Chem 223, we've been looking at when Lewis acids and Lewis bases come together. And we've been looking at formation of complex ions. And a complex ion is just a Lewis acid center with Lewis bases around it, all right? We call them a complex, different names and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, a ligand is a new term we're going to use. And when you're big time metal chemist, no, if you're big time into this kind of chemistry, a ligand is a Lewis base. So we meant, let's just remember that a Lewis base is anything with a lone pair of electrons on it. So anything with a lone pair in theory could be a Lewis base and it could be a complex, a ligand, excuse me. So the complexes that form have Lewis acid centers and ligands or Lewis bases that go around it. And they're very, very common. We've seen some in like the Le Chatelier's principal lab uh, that made the solids disappear and stuff like that, which is crazy. So the main part of this here is I wanna introduce the term ligand. All right, it's a weird term. Uh, somebody used it in their class presentation. I can't remember who now, but um, ligand is just like a Lewis base. You can literally think about it that way. And when you have ligands on a transition metal, that's when you make a coordination compound or a complex ion. Any questions on that? 
All right, a coordination compound then has just one or more complexes, one or more complex ions. Sometimes they're neutral with just themselves, it's hard to say. So these are all examples of coordination compounds, all right? And they look kind of weird, and we're gonna talk about it. So notice the square brackets. That's real common when it comes to complex ions and coordination compounds. They'll put square brackets around the Lewis acid and its Lewis base or ligand outside parts. And if you have any other ions that are needed, they put them on the outside. Coordination numbers are referred, are something that helps scientists figure out how many pieces are connected to the central atom. All right, so a coordination number is nothing more than the number of donor atoms, the ligands, the Lewis bases, that are surrounded to the central metal atom. So if you have CONH363+, plus, all right, and I said, what's their coordination number? You would look at the central atom, which here is cobalt, and there's six ammonias, all right? So that means six little ammonia molecules are all the way around. That means this is gonna have a coordination number of six. Six pieces around the cobalt, coordination number six. <clears throat> Here's a platinum complex. It has four chlorides around it. Each of the chlorides is a ligand, so this would have a coordination number of four. This thing right here has one, two, three, probably chlorines and some kind of organic piece here. A fourth piece, that would be a coordination number of four as well. Um, You'll see lots of different coordination numbers in science, especially inorganic chemistry, but the most common are six and four and sometimes two. And I'll show you some examples of these as we go through here. So, so here's an example of a complex that's made with silver. And silver chloride is really insoluble. It coats glassware. But if you add some ammonia to it, this complex ion is made and it helps people get rid of the stuff on their glassware. Anyway, this is a coordination number of two. So the central atom here would be a silver and the outside little blue circles here are each an ammonia, all right? So it has a coordination number of two, two pieces around that transition metal. Now, when it comes to the coordination number four, there's two geometries that are possible. And in Chem 222, we saw that almost everything with four things was tetrahedral. And tetrahedral is super common in these as well. So for example, in the Le Chatelet's principal lab, we saw ZNNH342+. That was a good example of a tetrahedral zinc. So zinc was in the middle, and each of those red dots there would be like an ammonia. And there's an example with iron. But sometimes you'll end up with square planar four coordinate things. So this is an example of a nickel with four cyanides around it. And this actually does take a square planar geometry. If it's square planar at 90 degrees or 180 degrees, there's nothing above and below the plane of the molecule. With the transition metal, what do you think might be above and below the transition metal that's not being shown? Electrons. Electrons, you bet. Transition metals usually have a lot of electrons around. So usually square planar complex ions will have electrons both above and below the molecule. I did put it on this slide, but we also saw in Le Chatelet's principle the ZnOH4 minus two ion. Woohoo, I'm sure that you remember that from that one. But anyway, that would be an example of a square planar. It's got a lot more electrons around it. Above and below that zinc, you're gonna have some lone pair electrons. Uh, six is very common also in coordination. Now in Chem 222, we saw some octahedral complexes with sulfur and phosphorus and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> but you can see this a lot with transition metals too. Uh, Transition metals are a little bigger than carbons and nitrogens, so they like to have more space. They have more room for bonds. So this is an example of a six-coordinate cobalt complex. So each of the blue dots right here would be a cyanide ion. If it was iron, that would be the central one. Notice that there's only three of these. 
I've only been showing you uh, Lewis spaces with one pair of electrons so far. EN is an abbreviation for something with two connections possible, and I'll show you that here. All right. <clears throat> Now, it's important to talk about charges on complexes or, or, or complex ions or compounds because transition metals are all over the place. However, like we've seen since Chem 221, usually the anions are a key to finding out what the charge is on the iron. So let's say I said, uh, hey John, uh, what's the charge on the iron? So what John would do is he could look back on the nomenclature list of polyatomic ions, or just know off top of his head, that cyanide is always minus one. And there's six cyanides, so that would be negative six from those. But the compound itself, or the complex ion, has only negative three. So that means that that iron has to be a positive three charge to cancel out a lot of the negative ones from the cyanide. So I would call this a complex ion because it has a charge. An anion is a negative charge species. This is an anionic complex ion. Now, over here on this one, this compound with cobalt doesn't have an overall charge. Does ammonia NH3 have a charge on it? No. Uh, ammonia is like water. It's a neutral compound. If you can have a bottle of ammonia and pour it out and stuff, or ammonia solution, uh, then it's going to be neutral. So ammonia doesn't have a charge. Like you can draw a Lewis structure with ammonia and there wouldn't be any positives or negatives. But what's the usual charge on a chloride? Negative one. Well done. There's two negative one chlorides and a bunch of neutral ammonia, but there's no overall charge. So if this is negative two, no charge right there, and the whole compound is neutral, that cobalt is gonna be a positive two cobalt. So again, like we've seen, you can a lot of times use the non-metals to figure out what the charge is on these crazy transition metals. Because again, cobalt is all over the place, positive three, positive two, et cetera, et cetera. This is a compound because it has both a positive part, which is in square brackets, and the negative ions on the outside, but there's no net charge over. Any questions? Okay. So here's a kind of question you might see. It says, what's the charge on this copper atom in this complex, all right? Well, again, here's ammonia, and ammonia, like water, is a neutral compound. There's no charge from there. But we have two chlorides again. So what do you think the charge is going to be on this copper? Two. Positive two. That's right. The two negative one chlorides balance the positive two on the copper two plus. So if we had just the part in square brackets, we would write Cu NH32 plus two. It would be a cation complex ion. But this is a compound, a coordination compound, because all the positives and negatives cancel out and it's neutral. Any questions? Okay. Now, Ligands uh, are all Lewis spaces, all right? But some Lewis spaces have more than one way to connect to the central atom. So scientists developed this weird thing called dentate, and apparently dentate is tooth in Latin. I don't, I can't even speak English, so don't look at me, but anyway, dentate apparently is like tooth, all right? So if you hear things about monodentate, Monodentate means one tooth that can get into the complex ion. But what I showed you earlier, that little EN thing, that was a bidentate ligand. And that means it has two places to connect to the metal. And you can't have tetradentate, four places to connect. There are some hexadentate ligands, six places to connect. Polydentate means there's two or more donor atoms. And if you've ever heard the term chelating agent, that just means you've got more than one tooth in whatever you're adding to connect to a metal. So you want to get rid of the metal, 
Why would you want to get rid of the metal? No, seriously, if you want to get rid of the metal for some reason, you can add a chelating agent to pull it out, in theory, from whatever you've got. And we'll talk about that a little bit, too. So dentate just means the number of places that can connect to the metal atom. And there's actually quite a few different variations here of this. Um, monodentate is oftentimes going to be water. It can also be ammonia. Uh, water is super common, of course, because we live on the earth, all right? And every time you have a transition metal that dissolves in water, it's got these water molecules actually around it all the time. <clears throat> so here's just a list of some common monodentate ligands. And again, all of these, just remember, it means they have one place to connect to the metal. So water, I said, was super common. We saw some cyanides. Ammonia is another example of something that happens. Um, we used the thiocyanide ion in the equilibrium lab at the beginning of Chem 223. That's a monodentate ligand. Uh, you can use hydroxide, like that zinc hydroxide thing I mentioned. Carbon monoxide is pretty funky. Oxide, all the halides, chloride, bromide, iodides are very common. So these are just examples of things that connect to metals with one connection point, all right? But there's more than one connection point for some of these. Now, when you get into coordination compounds, sometimes you use some of these ions, and these ions are bigger, but they have more than one place to connect. <clears throat> so it's like, you know, I go up Clifford one more time, let's do it, man. Oh, one good place and stuff like that, cool. And most of the time, that's what these are too, but, Maybe Clifford and I have a second place we can connect. Yeah, good to see you, man. Thank you for always being my example, man. But anyway, Paul, Clifford has done this for me many different times, so I'll that back on. So but these are bidentate. They have literally two places to connect, two hands to shake, all right? Now, metals have lots of hands, all right? So the metal just sits there and stuff, and these things come up. <clears throat> these are actually pretty common. Earlier, I showed this thing called ethylene diamine. It's abbreviated EN. You can probably figure out why. Ethylene is usually a carbon-carbon bond. Diamine means two nitrogen-containing species. In organic chemistry last quarter, we looked at this a little bit. What's important for here now is not the name. Nitrogen almost always has a lone pair on it. So this is a longer molecule, and each side of it has a place to connect, a tooth, all right? So if you're the metal in the center, ethylene diamine comes around, each nitrogen has the capacity to connect with the metal center. So that's why this is a bidentate ligand. <clears throat> now, oxalate, which is used, is actually found naturally in broccoli, if I remember right. Oxalate is bidentate. This thing, Ofen, I'll show you a picture of, is huge. It's also bidentate. So these just have more than one place to connect to that metal center. So here's some examples of how these bidentate ligands can connect to metals. Now, the having a octahedral six coordinate metal is very common. So this cobalt is, has six places to connect, but only three ethylene diamines, because each of these takes up two of the six spots. So the first one takes up two, the <clears throat> second one takes up two, and the third one takes up two, fills up all the places for cobalt. This is an example of an oxalate system around chromium. And again, oxalate is bidentate, so three times two, six. This one has the OFAN, which is just a huge molecule, and four monodentate ammonias. So again, these are all octahedral, all six coordinate, but one of these is, at least one of them, is taking up two spots on it. Now, here's some Lewis structures for these different pieces, all right? Ethylene diamine, uh, in Chem 222, we talked about how the amines were the bases of organic chemistry. And they almost always have a nitrogen with a lone pair. There'll be at least one hydrogen. These have two, and then something's connected to something organic. Now, ethylene is normally a carbon-carbon double bond, but ethylene, when it's got things on the end, a lot of times they use that terms and other complex. I don't know why. Anyway, I'm just the messenger. But anyway, this is ethylene diamine. And the little red stars are where it connects to the metals. Now, oxalate, which comes from oxalic acid, has also two negative oxides. 
these are neutral oxygens. If you figured out formal charges, I'm bringing up all these Chem 221 and Chem 221 charges just to make you start thinking about them again. But anyway, these would have the negative one formal charge and that's where the attack happens. That's where the dentate happens. And then this thing is called orthophenanthrolene. It's a much larger molecule, but again, look, here's the nitrogens. So you can see how the places that connect to the metals are usually gonna be nitrogen, oxygen, once in a while chlorides and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> This picture shows an example of what's called ribbon theory. And I just wanna show some pictures of it. This is used a lot in biochemistry. So instead of showing the nitrogen, carbon, carbon, nitrogen with all the different pieces, um, ribbon theory is sometimes used just to show where the connections happen. So each one of these blue, gold, blue pieces is an ethylene diamine. And in biochemistry, they don't need to show like every little amine group or something like that on there. So they'll just have a ribbon to show like how the geometry works. And that's what they're using in this picture. So this is a cobalt center with one, two, three ethylene diamines around it, all right? And the blues would represent nitrogen atoms on the ethylene diamine. They're not showing hydrogens, they're not even showing carbons or even the vertices of carbon like we did in Chem 222. This is yet another thing that scientists will do to represent the molecules. This is an iron with three orthophenanthrolines around it. And I was able to find an animation. Sometimes this is a type of what they call a propeller compound because it looks like a propeller on a little ship. I think this would be a pretty twisted propeller. But anyway, there's one right there, there's one right there, and one right there. So again, each nitrogen connects to the iron. So one phenanthrolene connects two places on the iron. And again, they're all essentially octahedral. They have to arrange themselves so they don't interact with each other, and that's not a small thing. Uh, when it comes to geometry, this little molecule is quite a trip. Now, Next week in lab, we're going to use nickel dimethyl glyoxime, nickel two. And dimethyl glyoxime is a great way to uh, figure out if you have nickel or not. This is what you guys made that time. It's a cool red color. You'll see it in lab yourselves. These guys are excellent, which is cool. Anyway, DMG is obviously a nicer abbreviation than dimethyl glyoxine. The important parts though, is that here we've got the nitrogens. And in this case, they react really well with nickel. All right, it's a four coordinate square planar kind of geometry, but it makes it, and it makes a really nice red solid, you'll see. Now, dimethyl glyoxime has a lot of other atoms. It has OHs right there, and there's another funny set of dots connecting to this oxygen. What kind of bond is that right there? Does anybody remember? Hydrogen bond? Bam, nice job. Hydrogen bonds, yeah. Hydrogen bonds connect the outside of this molecule, and in here we have Lewis base, Lewis acid kind of interactions. Oh, it's all coming together. Anyway, you'll see this compound in lab and it's a lot prettier than my silly video. Notice how this is a flat molecule. So above and below the nickel, got some lone pair electrons. All right. <clears throat> This is ethylene, gly ethylene glycol. Ethylene glycol is sometimes used in radiators to keep your thing from freezing. And the question is, if you had to describe this in terms of a dentate, what would you call it? And the way to do this is remember that these dentates are all about like teeth and teeth come from Lewis bases. Well, Lewis bases have to have lone pairs. So it's possible you could have just one of them uh, do it. But of course, because there are two oxygens, each with a lone pair on it, it makes more sense that this, you'd at least propose that this was a bidentate ligand. It's a little bit bigger, like ethylene diamine, you had nitrogens on the outside and two carbons in the middle. So this one would most likely be a bidentate ligand as well. Zero dentate doesn't exist as a term, but it sounds kind of cool here. <laughs> Any questions? All right, for different reasons, my favorite of the ligands is EDTA. 
Now, you might have heard of EDTA from biology or another class before, but EDTA is a polydentate ligand. And what that means is it kind of adjusts itself to make one-to-one -one complexes with almost all the metals on the periodic table. It doesn't do a very good job with group 1A, so sodiums, potassiums, those kind of things. But everything else, EDTA is essentially a metal scavenger. So for some reason, you'd want to take the metal out, and there are good reasons, not me just being cheesy with Clifford. If you wanted to take the metal out, EDTA is a great way to usually get your metals out. When you have EDTA with the metal, it forms a very stable complex, and they're almost always water soluble. So you can filter it, you can decant it, things we're gonna do in lab today, or Kayla did on Wednesday, actually. Um, High formation constants mean that the EDTA metal complex wants to form, all right? And again, for everything but group 1A metals, it's a very high K. I'll show you some examples of the Ks I found. Um, another cool thing about EDTA, it's called a primary standard. If you've had a chemical sitting in the shelf for a while and you take it off to use it, it might have got some water on it or it might have been decomposed or something. EDTA is so stable, they consider it to be a primary standard. So you have it sit on your shelf for four years. In theory, you should be able to take it off the shelf and use it with no problems. And again, that's pretty rare. Like acids and bases will change their concentrations and stuff. But EDTA and compounds that are primary standards should be good to go for a long time, which is kind of cool. But most importantly. This is EDTA. It's an anticoagulant. We use it to treat blood clots. Now look what happens when I introduce it onto a sample of vampire blood. Take a step back. The reaction is energetic. Secure. Maybe you could use it to explode some vampire heads. Okay, I love the original Blade trilogy. All right, super nerdy, big surprise. Anything else from me, you'd be so surprised, I know. But anyway, uh, Wesley Snipes and stuff like that was Blade. And they're remaking Blade. I'm so excited by that, too. And I think guys going to play Blade will be cool. But anyway, in the original Blade movie, if you ever get to see it, they use EDTA to fight vampires. Yeah! So EDTA, as well as being really cool for taking metals out, no vampires around us. Okay, I need to get a life, I know. Anyway, EDTA, this is what it looks like. EDTA stands for ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid. So earlier we saw EDT, uh, EN, ethylene diamine, the two carbons with nitrogens and hydrogens. Well, in EDTA, the hydrogens are being removed and they put essentially a type of acetic acid system on. Now here we're seeing a negative four. All of these oxygens are like negative, but this is where then they'll connect to the metal. So in theory, EDTA has one, two, three, four, five, six places to connect. So if you have a metal that likes to be octahedral, no problem. Each of those places is taken up by EDTA and it extracts it from whatever you've got. On the other hand, if you have a nickel, which is usually four coordinate, no problem. They'll use four of the pieces. It's usually these four, but I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's really cool at adapting to whatever the metal needs. Here's some more examples of the ribbon theory. Now again, imagine the metal M is cobalt here, and this is a negative EDTA, so that means it has a negative four. But anyway, that showing all the atoms can get really messy. So this is why people like using this ribbon theory thing, all right? Here's the nitrogen, nitrogen core, and then each nitrogen has two oxygens around it. So again, it just surrounds the metal and is able to pull the metal then out of your solution. So if you don't want the metal, then that would be it. Um, I'll stop with this slide, but these are the nat base 10 log Ks of the formation constants. Now, formation constants are almost always much larger than one. They are so big here, they took the log of them, and they're really big numbers. So these numbers, these big positive numbers, just say EDTA wants to react with the metals, all right? It is good to go. Metals are 
almost powerless when it comes to EDTA. It's so good about taking things out. So, all right. I'll talk about other chelating agents, other types of ligands for metals uh, more on Monday. Any questions? Have a great day.